Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is so great to see you. I missed you last week. I've actually missed you for two weeks. Two weeks ago, I got to hang out with the kids, <laughs> which was so much fun because I haven't done that in ages. Uh, but last week, we were on vacation. We went with extended family to Branson. Um, it was our first time vacationing with that side of the family, and we had a good time. Uh, yes. Yes. You know, we, we have a family like a lot of families where, you know, we... we, we, we we're similar in some ways, and we are not in others, you know? It's like, it's like getting different shades of orange together. A lot of times it's fine, but every once in a while someone wakes up in a pumpkin mood, and someone wakes up in a salmon mood, and those just don't go together at all. Um, but, but overall, overall, it was a wonderful, a wonderful time. We did have probably our, our, our one big moment of tension was lunch last Sunday. We went to Paula Dean's restaurant. Everybody ever been to Paula Dean's restaurant? Okay. So for those of you who haven't, A, Southern cooking. Not a surprise to anybody, okay? Uh, Southern cooking, honestly, not the top of my list, but I figured I could find something to eat. But the other big thing about Paula Dean's restaurant is it's served family style. So your entire table orders between two to four main dishes, depending on what you want to spend per person, and you collectively order sides, and then you've got the lazy Susan in the middle of the table, and you, and you share. So this group of 10 has to come to an agreement on what we're going to order, okay? And, uh, and, and as I'm sitting there, I'm becoming keenly aware of the fact that, that in our collection of 10, opinionated people... <laughs> There's one member in our group whose voice tend to, tends to rise to the loudest, um, who, who tends to dominate conversations, is the most likely to call shots quickly and be dismissive of others. And they're sitting right across the table from me. <laughs> well, he could have been sitting right across from the table, but no, it's not my spouse. His side of the family, now you know where he gets it. Anyway, no, kidding, 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 kidding. I love you, babe. Um, I'm looking at the menu, and, and honestly, the first thing I'm thinking of are, are my kids. They love a lot of food, but a lot of the food here, not their favorites. And I'm thinking, how am I going to find dishes that they're going to enjoy? Because my kids are great. They eat whatever you serve them. But when you're paying money to go to a restaurant, particularly Branson prices, you want to enjoy what you're eating, you know? And, and children are no different than that. So as I'm sitting there and, and I'm, I'm hearing this family member start sharing things, and I'm like, I don't even want to eat that. And I had this absolute intense moment of panic <laughs> that I'm going to have to eat whatever this family member orders, that they're going to push their ideas. Well, this will be fine. This will be fine. This will be fine. And, and, and me and, and my kids, we're just going to have to have to surrender to that. And I, and I don't want to cause a scene, but I do not. In this moment, I do not want to be beholden to this person's will for lunch. <laughs> We were able to come to a lovely agreement. It really didn't take that long. We actually celebrated the fact that we could come to an agreement on what to order, and everybody was okay. Uh, it was nice. I will say that one of my children, once we left, said, you know, if I wanted to eat family style, I would have stayed at home. But other than that, um, other than that, it was a nice time. But I marveled at the fact that that moment of panic was real. I mean, it was, it was real. Looking back, going, wow, I felt like a caged animal in that moment. And it only lasted about, about you know, five, ten seconds. But it was so real, this thought that they're going to force their will on me, and I'm going to be stuck in a situation that I don't want to be stuck in. Um, and and, and that's, that's pretty normal for us, you know? We, 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 what do I say? It's kind of ingrained in our nature. Uh, we do our best to control as much as we can about our circumstances, you know? And, and we do it for good reasons. We do it because we want ourselves and we want the people that we love to be safe and be happy and be fulfilled and, and all those great things. And so when we see someone else start to impose their will over, over our will, we feel threatened. And we, we push back, you know, that, that famous sibling phrase, you are not the boss of me. That's not just a sibling thing, y'all. That, that, that's something that, that happens so often from, from littles all the way to adults. You know, many of you were in the aisles at your local discount store doing back to school shopping. You know, and you walk through Target, and it's the those amazing designs on the folders and such the cool notebooks. And then you pull out the list from school that says, you know, one inch plain black three ring binder, and one duo tang two pocket yellow folder. And you're like, bag that! My kid's getting Black Panther, and teacher can just deal. You know, even 
something so simple as school supplies, right? No, well, you, not your will, my will. Um, we resist surrendering to the will and the ideas of others, particularly when that will is different or when it's counter to ours. Um, but as we're going to explore today, dear Christians, that creates a problem for us. But before we go any further, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this incredible family. Lord, as we continue to dive into your word, would you open our minds, open our hearts, Lord? Would you shine a light and help us to see what we can do to bring ourselves even closer into alignment with you? We love you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. So we've been doing our deep dive into the Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus' amazing prayer uh, kind of manifesto um, that he gives within the Sermon on the Mount. And so let's start by, let's just pray that through together, okay? Jesus starts in Matthew 6, verse 9. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, we have been kind of taking this apart verse by verse, right? We started, Pastor Lisa uh, led us through the, that first section where we start, and Jesus instructed us to start by remembering who we're talking to, right? We are talking to our Father. We are talking to God and his holy place in heaven. And then we talked about his holiness, right? We get our minds set that it's not, it's, there's, there's Abba, Father, but there's also Yahweh in there, right? His holiness, his set-apartness, his hallowedness. And we remember that and get our, our headspace right when we're praying to him. And then last week, Pastor Zach unpacked that next section where it says, your kingdom come, right? We're praying to God that, that his kingdom come and, and manifest itself here, right now, in our midst, through us. God, how can we help you do that? But today we're going to take a look at what is perhaps the most challenging part of this entire prayer, your will be done. Four little words, very painful. <laughs> On the surface, it sounds great. What believer wouldn't agree with that, right? God's will, God's plan, God's desire, two thumbs up, absolutely. But when we start unpacking what that means, specifically, fully, hmm, it can get a little less desirable, honestly. Because when, by definition, if we have to articulate, God, I want your will to be done, there's kind of a, a correlation that's uh, saying, and if it's not my will, that's okay. I'm not focused on my will. That we can go into prayer and with absolute honesty and openness say, Abba, completely ignore my wants and desires. Unless it's exactly what you want. Because your will is my top priority. Can we truly pray that with absolute sincerity every single time? And that's our challenge today, because that's hard. That concept of, of your will be done is a kind of by definition, it's countercultural. You know, truly, few things are, are more fundamental to modern uh, American life than the idea of choice. You know, the freedom to decide your own life. The, the only, kind of the only really wrong thing you can do in our society today is to impose your choice on somebody else's, right? You do you, boo-boo. That's the new American <laughs> motto, you know? Um, so this idea of, of submitting or surrendering to the will of another really rubs against the grain. It is so counter to everything we're surrounded by all the time. Okay, so it, it, it makes it hard for this to become just a natural part of who we are. We have to be intentional about it. But I think it goes, it goes deeper than that. It's more than just a, a cultural thing. Um, I think it's, a, it's a, honestly just a basis level of humanity. You see it in, in, in all forms of, of people. You tell a toddler that they can't have something, all that toddler wants is what you told them they couldn't have. Flip side, you tell the toddler, no, you're going to eat that broccoli. Where's that broccoli going to end up? Boom, <laughs> bingo, <laughs> says the mom of toddlers sitting in our front row. You know, um, I love you teens, parents. 
If you really want to guide your teen who's in a surly mood to make a specific choice, don't mention that choice. Because right. once you mention it, it's <coughs> off the table, you know? But, but, <laughs> but again, I mean, it's, it's even more than that. I, I, I heard the testimony of, of a recovering addict early this week, and they were talking about uh, the intervention that led them to rehab. And you know, they're, they're in the intervention with their friends and realizing there's no way they're getting out of this without going to rehab. It's a done deal. But even in that moment, their will rises up. And, and the addict walks up to the interventionist and says, fine, I'll go to rehab, but not the rehab you picked! <laughs> <laughs> I may not get my will, but you're not getting your will either. You know, it's just, it's so much a part of our nature. It's how we tend to roll. I know what I want, and, and it's, not, it's not random, it's not capricious, there's intent behind it. And from my perspective, there's goodness behind it. And, and to get where I want, this path that I've determined, that I've willed, is, is what I figure out is gonna be the most efficient and pain-free way possible. But when we're talking about God's will be done, he doesn't follow those parameters. I mean, God's will gets all twisty, turny. It takes forever when God's will takes over. It's slow. It feels like there's no progress being made. Sometimes you've got to go backwards before you get to go forward. It's frustrating, right? And there's almost always struggle. There's struggle. There's, there's suffering. God's will for his own purposes, involves sacrifice and denial and grief and loss and death sometimes. And, you know, certainly when you're standing at the beginning, at least half the time when you're looking down what appears to be God's will, you're like, yeah, I'm not sure that's where I want to go. I'm not sure that's the destination I'm interested in, Lord. So to, to pray with honesty and sincerity, your will be done. That's a gamble. That's tough. That opens us up to things that, wow, mm, can be hard for us. And yet in this, in this powerful passage, man, right near the beginning, right near the beginning, our Savior directs us to pray purposefully for this very thing. Now, you know, you can read scripture always with a cynical eye and go, well, that's easy for him to say. He's part of the Trinity. He's God's son. Of course, Jesus is going to advocate for God's will. Well, yeah. Um, but one of the things that I have come to really just adore about Jesus, and it's a thing I have to continue to remind myself, Jesus doesn't lead us anywhere. He has not been himself. We've been in Matthew 6 for the last several weeks. We're going to jump ahead 20 chapters. Okay, we're not on a mountainside anymore. Now we're in a garden. It's the night before Jesus is going to be crucified, and he is wrestling with this exact issue. Starting at verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took two, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. That in itself is, is powerful because we see where, where Jesus is at. You know, this is such an interesting snapshot. It's not the most flattering vision of Jesus. You know, when you want to think about your heroes, you want to think about them walking bravely and boldly into the jaws of death. And this is Jesus saying, I am so grief-stricken, I feel like I'm dying already. And when we think about, you know, I mean, Jesus is not a drama queen. He's not prone to histrionics. He's a very literal kind of guy, you know, very, very straightforward. And we've seen or heard stories of other martyrs who have had that presence of the Holy Spirit fall on them and be able to withstand whatever suffering and torture uh, has, you know, leads up to their demise and just, just withstand it with grace. And at times it seems almost joy, according to some, uh, some accounts of those moments. But that's not what we're seeing here in Jesus. So what's different about this? 
Next verse, it says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet, read this with me, not as I will, but, oh, I'm sorry, you're reading a different version than I am. <laughs> I want your will to be done, not mine. That's my bad. <laughs> what sets Jesus' experience apart from other martyrs, honestly, is this cup that he talks about, because in, in the Old Testament, the cup is, is synonymous with God's wrath. Um, and God's wrath in this case manifests, it, manifests itself in his absence. I can't even begin to imagine what that's like for Jesus. Jesus who has been with the Father, who has known the presence of Yahweh literally since before time began. And for the very first time feels Yahweh pulling away. I mean, we just can't, we just can't get that kind of father-son bond that God and Christ share. And so it, it, it had to feel, it had to feel like the breath being sucked out of him, like he really was suffocating, not having God with, with him. And surprise, surprise, that's not what Jesus wants. So in this, in this moment of incredible vulnerability, we see the Son of God confessed that, that his desire in this moment, his personal will, is actually different from God's. And he prays for that, Dad, I want something else. I don't want this. If it is at all possible, please take your wrath off me. Come back to me. I can't handle this. But even in the middle of that suffering, in the middle of, of that agony that he's going through, Jesus stays focused. He keeps that main thing the main thing and says, yet not as I will, but as you will. What you want, your will, Father, is, is more important even than this absolute agony I'm going through. And I surrender to that. It's really, really just it's just beautiful. It's a perfect picture of what we're talking about today. Um, what Jesus is sharing, what he's, what he's teaching his disciples about on the mountainside. We see his integrity. You know, he, he doesn't just preach about praying for God's will. In his weakest moment, when he's alone, in the dark, nobody else there to show off for, we see Jesus practice what he's preaching, what he's leading us to do. And through that, what we see is what it looks like to truly trust God. Because when we trust, we can surrender. I mean, that's the whole idea of a trust fall. You know you can put somebody behind you that you absolutely trust and you will fall without thinking about it because you know they're going to catch you and you know who you can put behind you that you would never trust. <laughs> right? It, now, now, now just kind of blow that a whole idea up. Okay? And that's Jesus saying, Lord, I trust you so much. I am willing to fall into absolute agony because I trust you that much. And he doubles down, jumping to verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then again in verse 44, he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. This trust, when we can experience that trust, when we can say, you know what, yes, I believe God is God. I believe in his will. I believe in his vision and his power. This is our way of saying, I don't have all the answers, but I know you do, God. Yes, from my vantage point, I see this, but I trust, God, that you have a totally different worldview, that, that, that your perspective, your, your big picture view, your hallowed, holy view is more complete than mine. And even though this looks like a path I don't want to take, I trust that you see what I can't. When I look back over my shoulder, because I was doing that this week as I was, as I was going through this passage, I'm, I'm thinking about all the other times I've gone, God, I want this. I'm so glad he's God and I'm not. Oh, my stars. Because, you know, I was going to live in Chicago. I was a big city girl. And I was going to go teach 
in inner city Chicago. That's funny, y'all. But that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted to do. And God said, but my will is that you teach in a microscopic school in central Illinois. <laughs> but through that microscopic school, God brought me to the Church of the Nazarene. And through the Church of the Nazarene, I rededicated my life to Christ. And through that process, God called me into ministry. Could he have done that in Chicago? Yes. I'd wager a lot of money. It would have taken a lot longer <laughs> than it did where God led me, you know. When I was in sixth grade, I wanted to marry Doug Brand. <laughs> No idea where Doug Brand is right now, but I'm pretty content with where God led me. <laughs> Hubby and I celebrated 18 years last Sunday. And we got two beautiful babies to show for it, you know. Now, all of this, this, this surrendering to God's will, doesn't mean that we don't share our desires with God. It doesn't mean that we don't let God know what our will is. Again, Jesus modeled that, right? He wants to know the desires of our hearts. But even when we do that, Lord, this is my will, this is my dream, this is my hope, this is what I want so much. We do that with that mentality and, and, and sometimes even with the words, but not my will, Lord, yours. This is not an easy part of this prayer to implement. Um, that's actually part of our big idea. Your will be done is perhaps the hardest prayer that Jesus asks us to pray because it requires sacrificing our own will and trusting in God even when it hurts. Because we all walk around with a wish list. You actually had one on your seat when you, when you came in. You go ahead and pull that out. It's, I mean, we can call it a wish list. It's not. It's a will list. It's my will. It's, it's, it's what drives me. But if we're going to be serious about praying this, fellow believers, um, if we're going to commit to what Jesus is teaching and, and what he's modeling, you know, um, we've, we've got to come to a point where we are willing to surrender, to give up our personal will. Now, I know who I'm talking to, and my guess is you have already done that to a degree. Okay? There are some things that you have wrestled with and surrendered some things but my challenge for you in these next few minutes is that you let the Holy Spirit dig deep a little bit and shine a light around that you open yourself up and say God is there anything in me is there a, a personal desire is there a wish is there anything in me that I want so much that I am not willing to let go on. You know, something that if God miraculously texted you right now and said, yeah, that thing, believe it or not, that's not my will. My plan doesn't include that. Where if God said that to you, you'd go, okay, let's just talk for a minute, Lord. I'm going to push back on that. There are so many things that we're just, and part of it's because we're convinced it, it must be what God wants, right? Career goals, that, that dream job, um, staying at your job, finding a different job, when retirement's going to be. Financial goals, financial dreams that we have. Doesn't God want us to be prosperous? Yes, but not always in the way we think. And it might be that way for you, but what if it's not? Are you willing to let go of that if that's what God says? Health issues. We prayed for that just this morning. And there are so many times we go to God in prayer and he wants to know our, our healing miraculous will. But are we willing if God chooses to heal differently than what we were desiring, what we were willing for? Are you willing to surrender that dream home, the dream car, the dream job, the dream college, the dream vacation? Those things on your bucket list, you know? Relationships. Man, this was a big one that God and I had to go through for a while. You know, um, to have relationships or not to have relationships. A married life, a single life. A married life that continues or doesn't continue. Um, friendships. Family relationships. Sometimes it's, it's more, I don't know, 
contemporary cultural issues. It's entirely possible that um, that thing that you've been advocating for on Facebook might not be God's will. We talk about politics, we talk about the midterms, we're talking about 2024 elections already. <laughs> Even though we think it's God's will, are we willing to surrender it if ever we find out it's not? Sometimes it's not even our stuff. It's, it's the people we care about. God, I'm surrendering my entire life, but my will for my children, that's off limits. <laughs> Is there anything that maybe you're still white-knuckling a little bit? Any part of yourself that if God said right now his will was different, you would have a hard time accepting? <laughs> Pastor Adam, Pastor Tyler are going to come up and they're going to sing. And as they do... Would you take some time to reflect, to pray? You know, God, what part of me, what part of my will am I still putting over your will? Not that he said it's wrong, not that he said it's different, but you, it's just so important in me, God, that I'm, I'm, I would have a hard time if you asked me to let it go. As God reveals that, would you go ahead, write it on your wish list, and then if you're ready to surrender it, psh, cross it out. And on the bottom, as your own commitment to the Lord, write, your will be done. And then we've got a basket up here. And just come up and surrender that to him. Let's allow God to bring us even closer. Because when we can walk in that trust, the power that comes is amazing. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are God, that we can trust fully and completely, that you are the I am. God, would you help us right now to see any ways where we're not 100% trusting you, where we're so passionate, so earnest about, about this thing, about this person, about this dream, this wish, God, that it's just hard to let it go. Lord, would you, would you kind of massage our hearts a little bit right now? Relax our wills and, and give us that comfort to know that you care about that even more than we do. And so we can surrender to your will because your desire is to see us walk in the glory of your son. Your desire is is to see the people around us, the world around us, come to know you. Your desire is to have your kingdom come. And we want to be a part of that, Lord. Would you speak to us this morning, Jesus? In your name we pray. Amen.